college studying biology, <laughs> studying biology and Asian studies. And uh, I'm originally from Belgium, but then three years ago now I came to the U.S. to study uh, at Bowdoin College. And this summer I did some, my summer research with Professor Lichter, who will introduce himself in a minute. Uh, and we worked on Shad in the Androscoggin, that, which is what this is all about. <laughs> Okay, I'm John Lichter. I'm a senior at Bowdoin College. Um, actually, I'm a pro professor emeritus of biology and environmental studies. Um, if you don't know what that means, it basically means um, retire but doesn't know when to quit. Um, I've, um, I'm an ecosystem ecologist. And uh, I've spent a lot of time working in forests and specifically about how rising CO2 concentrations affect the carbon cycle in forests and nutrient cycling and so forth. Um, since coming to Bowdoin, I've um, really ex expanded my horizons quite a bit and have um, something uh, uh, in my background also was um, a, a lot of paleoecology or historical ecology. And so I was very interested in looking for a local ecosystem to study and the river system in Mary Meeting Bay pr proved to be very valuable being so close and um, interesting as well. Um, so we started that several years ago. And what we'll do today is I'm gonna set the stage for Renska um, kind of uh, more of a, a general um, kind of summary of the work that we've done over probably 15, 18 years. Um, and then I'll hand it off to her. And so right now I'm going to have to, again, get my, um, share my screen. And is that working? Yes, we can see your screen. OK. Um, so anyway, um, this work has had the support of the Friends of Mary Meeting Bay, um, the, uh, the Henry L. Daugherty uh, Charitable Foundation uh, supported Renska with uh, a summer fellowship. Um, also the Schiller Coastal Studies Center at Bowdoin and, and as well as the Sewell Foundation provided funds for the um, Eris sonar that we um, purchased uh, some time ago now and been using ever since. Um, this is a, a photograph of the Androscoggin River recently. Um, here's one of Mary Meeting Bay. Probably a lot of you know the, the, these sites. And again, we're, we're gonna focus on the um, dam at Brunswick Topsom, or Renska is. Um, this is um, the, a prelude to the splashing sturgeon, which we'll, we'll talk about a bit more later. Um, so here's, here's three shots of these large fish um, jumping out of the water, making a big splash. Um, as I mentioned, over the years, I've uh, mentored dozens of Bowdoin students in both classes and during the field season. And we learned a lot. And so, I mean, this was not entirely, but uh, pretty much a new area for me to do research in. And so I was learning a lot. The students, of course, were learning a lot. And we just tried a lot of things and we had a lot of fun doing it. This is Lucy Van Hook with a snapping turtle. You know, she did honors in biology. Um, kind of censusing the snapping turtles that are out in um, Mary Meaning Bay and also looking at how far they moved each year. Um, so, um, you'll, you'll notice there's a lot of, a lot of work was like uh, seining for small fishes, especially anadromous, uh, juvenile anadromous fish like um, alewife, shad and blueback herring. Um, we tried, you know, that in all kinds of different ways and from canoes, from boats, and just out there in our boots. Um, also, um, I'm going to talk a lot about vegetation in Mary Meeting Bay. Not the stuff that you see all over the place, the wild rice and the rushes and that in the intertidal zone, but the aquatic um, plants that are sub submerged uh, below low tide. Um, 
this was a class and this was my uh, one of my colleagues and friend Theo Willis from USM um, teaching students how to regurgitate a smallmouth bass to see what it's been eating. So that's the kind of thing we get into. Also, these Bowdoin students became very well acquainted with real mud, um, which we have out in Mary Meeting Bay. Again, a lot of netting. And so um, to explain this, um, kind of the logic of the overall project, um, a little review of food webs. Here's a um, kind of a, a diagram of a, a very um, general view of a marine food web where we have primary producers, things that eat the primary, primary producers are those that photosynthesize like diatoms and algae. Um, things that eat them would be herbivores. And then the next stage would be things that eat the herbivores, bigger fish that eat the, the carnivorous things that eat the herbivores and so on. And it's probably um, obvious that if you knocked out one of these trophic levels, like if you just reduce the number of organisms in that, it would very much be a problem for everything above it. And in fact, that's what we've done. Um, and we'll get into this, but so we've actually, we're actually fertilizing the planet with things that plants need to grow. And so we're adding a lot to the base but we've knocked out a middle layer. So all of this energy from the sun and the nutrients and so forth that are being supplied in, mostly through runoff for uh, fertilizers and nitrogen um, from the atmosphere and so on, can't actually get up to the upper trophic levels to the, actually the species that most people care about. And so it's a, it's a bottleneck in other words. Okay, so that's conceptually what we're talking about. Um, this is what we're really looking at. Um, this is a, I don't know if you can see this, but it says a simplified food web for the Northwest Atlantic. Okay, so it doesn't look that simplified, but it is. Um, as complicated as this is, many of these nodes here, well, swordfish, that's a, that's a species, but many of them are actually groups of species, scallops, mussels, shrimps, gastropods, and so on. And so this com ecological complexity is daunting as a scientist, and it also uh, demands humility. It really does. In order to, um, you know, we're only going to uh, understand if we if we can understand a big part of it, we should be glad that we can do that. In other words, we'll never get like a physics-like understanding of a of an ecosystem. It's just not going to happen. Um, and as society, the same society all should, should be very humble about this um, basic compulsories anyway. And it's actually quite profound because historically, if the, the today the cod are zig moving all around great distances and they're vastly reduced from what they were. And they're moving great distances because their prey are moving. If their prey weren't moving, they're, they could build up a large population like in these grounds off the sheep scot in the Kennebec, and they could be managed as lobsters are managed now in territories, which in the lobster fishery is basically a te textbook example of people doing it right. And so it's possible then. So that's why, that, that's why this is important. On the other, the, the most recent thing, we had a paper in review for quite some time in, in the Penobscot area. And basically that shows that the cod spawning grounds are where they are because that's where alewife and blueback herring and shad juveniles are. It's not that the adult cod eat the juvenile alewife, blueback herring and shad. It's that the cod juveniles eat them and they need to eat them. Okay, so it's like, it's a, it's a life us history bottleneck if the juvenile, the juveniles can't eat, their cod population isn't gonna last. And what ended up happening is as all the rivers were dammed, the Androscoggin in 1753, the Kennebec in 1837, I forget the Penobscot was also 1830s, I think. The St. Croix was during the Civil War. The food, so basically the food supply was cut off 
to go in, at least in the coastal waters, meaning out to about 20 miles or so. And so the populations were collapsed. So we always think about overfishing of cod. And it's a classic example of overfishing of, you know, of cod. That's not like that didn't happen, but it's more um, profound than that. Actually, we were undermining the food web that cod depended on at the exact same time we were overfishing it. And so this is like from 1860 to 1890, when the cod population really collapsed. Everything in the 20th century was just kind of a relic, 10, 20% of what the original was and the fluctuations in that. Okay, so um, people try, you know, pe people tried with cod to um, learn how to, you know, do aquaculture and all that. Well, we could have the whole Gulf of Maine could be one great big aquaculture pool that you didn't have to take care of if we did this right. All right. Um, I need, do need to watch my time here a little bit so I don't cut Renska off. I'm watching that Renska. Okay. Um, the interesting thing is that this was known 100 and, you know, 120, 100 years ago. This is from Spencer Baird, um, Commissioner of Fisheries in 1873. And, I, and I'll just read this quickly. The general conclusions, which we have, dang it. Um, I got something in the way here, let me kill that. Okay, the general conclusions which have been reached as a result of repeated conversations with Captain Treat and other fishermen on the coast incline me to believe that the reduction of the cod and other fisheries so as to become practically a failure is due to the decrease off our coast of the quantity primarily of ale lives and secondarily of shad and salmon more than any other cause. And so, and this isn't the only example. Um, there were Canadians that, that basically nailed the problem. They just nailed it back then saying that the offshore cod fishery was dependent on the nearshore waters for nursery habitat and the estuaries. Okay, that's that's just a, I mean, there's other reasons why our rivers are important, but that's a big one. Okay, um, so we kind of started, you know, um, thinking about this system and thinking about the history of it. And students and I, uh, we spent a lot of time um, going through whatever documents there were. So. For instance, there's evidence from the 17 teens of overfishing. Um, Jane McFadden from um, Centers Point in Bodenham was deposed as an elderly woman in the 1780s about, and she mentions um, 20 small schooners in Merrimini Bay fishing for um, sturgeon in the, you know, at the time, I think they were there for four, the McFaddens were there for four years from 1718 to 1722 they were burned out basically by the Abenaki. And she mentioned that. Land clearance beginning in the 1720s, dams, again, the, the Brunswick Topsom, the first dam there was built in 1753. Agriculture began after the Revolutionary War ended, the, the Maine began to be filled up with people, um, uh, a lot of Revolutionary War soldiers that were built, building farms and so on. Water pollution, at least as early as the 1860s, and invasive species are in the record by the 1960s. Okay, so kind of one onslaught after another. Um, we're going to focus a lot on dams today. Um, here's a, a you know example of a large Atlantic sturgeon um, on Sturgeon Island, with which again was a major fishery. There's the Brunswick Hydroelectric. Um, the pollution, probably many of you, or at least some of you might remember um, foam um, floating on the water of Androscoggin. It was uh, just much worse. It was egregious. Um, it was just, uh, and raw sewage as well. So it's paper mill affluence and municipal waste. Um, these data um, we collected from um, basically a storage locker of uh, DEP up in Augusta. We went through many, many files where they have been taking, um, collecting oxygen readings. And this is down the Kennebec at the lowest spot was below Augusta a bit where they sampled it. So it was the closest site I could get to Mary Meeting Bay. But I think if anything, the Androscoggin side would look worse than this. 
than the Kennebec side. By, by all accounts, Anne Roscoggin was worse than the Kennebec, but they were both completely horrible in terms of pollution. So you see the collapse of this system. The dissolved, this is summertime dissolved oxygen. It goes to zero. It doesn't even have to get to zero and you're gonna have major fish, fish kills. And so they, these were reported years of major fish kills. Um, we published a paper, basically, this is a dead ecosystem in the 1960s by 1970. This rapid realize, uh, rise of dissolved oxygen, that's primary wastewater treatment. Okay, the Clean Water Act was in 1972, it took a few years for the plants to be built. And then, so instead of just dumping all the sewage and waste and um, paper mill effluent directly into the river, they had to treat it first. And that basically, so the material was break the material was breaking down outside of the river, so bacteria weren't, weren't consuming all the oxygen in the river. That's what that's showing. Okay, so here's one aspect of river recovery that happened very quickly. It's kind of a chemical aspect. Um, we were interested in well, what about the ecological aspects? How long are they taking? And so here we want to focus on vegetation. Um, again, this is the submerged aquatic vegetation. Um, and uh, this um, photograph is of eelgrass at the mouth of the Kennebec. So I show this and speak just because the water is much clearer, so it's easier to get a good picture to make my point. But there's a very similar species in the um, river systems called tape grass, and the, there's also several pond weeds. The point is, is that the aquatic vegetation is habitat for all kinds of small invertebrates that fish eat, especially juvenile fish, insects, and so on. The vegetation traps silt and the, and the um, the little critters like the silt. The bare sand doesn't do much at all for the, for the food web. Okay, so these are like islands of habitat there. And so one thing we can look at is the um, uh, both, we, we demonstrate that it's true that organisms like the, the vegetation instead of the bare sand or bare mud, whatever it is, and so that's what these students are doing. This is um, uh, John, Catherine Johnston and I'm blanking on um, Holly Jacobson, Corey Elo. And so they're collecting samples, screening them in the field, bringing it in and identifying all the critters, the small stuff that's in there. Um, in other words, think of this as fish food. So there's little worms, there's all kinds of copepods, um, uh, isopods, et cetera, there. And the data showing um, over here then, the SAV means of submerged aquatic vegetation and then unvegetated. So a number of macroinvertebrates is just three, four or five times higher in the vegetation. The diversity of species is much higher in the vegetation. And if you look at where resident fish are found, so these are like little mummy chugs, um, um, sticklebacks, other small fish. They are like 30 times more likely to be in the vegetation than they are outside the vegetation because it's providing them refuge from predation largely. Also, that's where their food is. Okay, here's a time series of vegetation coverage in Mary Meeting Bay. So we're not at, um, so, not, not exactly in Andro, but where the, you know, where the Andro is moving into Mary Meeting Bay and going uh, up to the Richmond Bridge and partway down the lower Kennebec. And this is done from aerial photographs. You see the collapse of this ecosystem. Okay, the aquatic plants are lasting a little longer than the oxygen, you know, it's probably in the late 60s that are lasting a little longer. But as that water got so skunky, so um, discolored, these plants can't get enough light to photosynthesize anymore. And so the system is crashing and through the 70s and 80s. It bottoms and starts back up when the water starts clearing up. Notice that it's taken a while though. So at least the data of the data we have around, that was 1981. 
you know, it's 20 some years or so for it to move a couple of percent. However, um, we have another data point in here and it's up, was up to 9.5%. And there was another point I don't have it on here in 2015, a student did this as a class project. And it just so happened that the Google Earth data that year were, or the, the database at that point was at low tide. We could see the aquatic vegetation and this was up about double. So it's up close to 20% then. And so these, this vegetation is recovering exponentially in Merrimeeting Bay. And it brings with it all of the resident fish and all of the food, basically food items that other fish need. Um, an important point, we're all in, we're, we all know about tipping points and how we can push a system too far and it suddenly collapses. It can work the other way too. Not that it, I'm not saying it always will, but it can. Where this, if we help a system along and get, there's a tipping point there we, and we help it get past that, it'll take off on its own. And that's what's happened here. This thing, these plants, you know, once they got past the point, they're seeding themselves in now. So it's, that's encouraging. In other words, we get out of nature's way. It can, nature can recover a lot on its own if we just get out of the way. Okay, here, these data are just showing um, that there is more food in the vegetation. And habitat recovery leads to fish recovery. Uh, this was a Haitian student um, from probably eight or 10 years ago, Patrick Millet. This is an eel. Um, he was trapping eels and he put together a bunch of data from the, that the DMR had from their beach saying yearly, a yearly um, uh, beach saying um, sampling. And if I connect, you know, you can see a gradual increase and in the, these are elvers that are showing up in the beach saying it's messy, but that's how small relic animal populations look because it's hit or miss all the time. Anyway, from 1985 to 2010, the habitat's recovering quickly and here come the elvers, okay? Okay, lastly, um, river, okay, so, so what I'm saying is that um, if we get out of the way, nature can recover, the river can recover in a lot of ways, but probably not always. We wouldn't wanna wait for the dams to erode away or the ice to break them up or whatever. It's just not gonna be, um, it, that's not gonna work. There, so there are in some ways we really need a restoration effort and the dams would be the, a big one there. there. There's probably other ways that we could probably stimulate or, or give nature, you know, give the recovery a help in, a, in some way. Um, but this is, this is a big one here. Now, this is the restoration on the Sebastocook at Benton Falls. It's a major effort on the Kennebec. Two dams came out, and then fish lifts went, on, went into the next three dams leading up to Sebastocook Lake. Nate Gray here is the chief um, DMR biologist that runs the fish lift, and he's also just a hero in my mind. He, um, over you know, 20 years, he just keeps pushing folks in watershed um, associations and so forth to reintroduce alewives and other anadromous fish into their systems, even though they, they're usually dead set against them in the, in the beginning. Anyway, this is probably the most fantastic fit river restoration story in the world right now. Um, we, so this is trucking and trapping until in 1999, the um, um, Augusta Dam when it came out, and then in the um, Fort Halifax Dam came out in 2008. Um, here, they they had some kind of a get a, a pump system. They were pumping alewives over the ladder over the dam, and then anyway, this is the recovery once the dams, the two dams were out of the way and fish lifts were on the rest of them. Nate, Pat, and we don't have his last few years, he didn't get to us, but they've been between two and four million fish each year. Now, I don't know if two, or two to four million sounds like a lot, 
but um, two to four million of something this big is a lot. That's a lot of fish. Um, anyway, they were over five million that year. Um, this is a lift. So this is a possibility at Brunswick. Um, I, you know, we're not engineers, um, but we're, you know, this, we're just bringing this, making this point. This is a possibility that, you know, this is an expensive structure. It's basically a lift, like, or like an elevator. It's like a fish elevator in a way. Um, the, basically the bucket, this is the bucket. It goes down, the water runs through it. The fish are going against the flowing water. They go into the bucket and it's on a timer and it comes up. Um, I have a quick video here to show you how effective this is. That's, that's low gear, no, that's high gear, and then it slows down at the top. Oh, I didn't mean that. Thought I had one more slide. I do. Um, anyway, that is a fish lift. Um, that's a couple thousand fish each each time it, it, it brings it up. So that's how you get, you know, and the thing's just running. Uh, I mean, Nate has to be there. He shuts it off in the evening. It's mostly because of the trough leading over the dam that because if they get blocked, if they get stopped in their passage for any reason, they'll consume the oxygen really quickly and you'll have a big mess of dead fish. So it's, um, it's a, he's totally there like 16 hours a day during the time when the fish are running. And there's two, that's the first and of three. There's a counter there, so he knows exactly how many fish go through. There's a few shad that make it up that far, but they're not, um, he has to fish them out with a net um, and handle them um, that way. Okay, to summarize then, uh, Mains rivers and estuaries historically played a really pivotal role in the, um, role in the supporting the marine food web. And that's why there were so many cod so close to the shore, if you go back to the pioneer era, they, people from Europe could not believe what they were looking at, the, just the abundance. Okay, um, whereas physical and chemical properties of the rivers can occur over a few years, recovery of the biological components, the ecological recovery takes decades. And we're not there yet. Um, but again, um, there's a there could be at least a nonlinear effect where it really gets ramping up fast. Um, even before near shore cod populations were overfished, dam building and changes on the land were undermining the marine food web on which cod and other ground fish depend. Okay. In terms of anadromous fish, Maine's rivers are far from their potential, but are improving. Um, if we even got a quarter of it, of the original, um, production back from these rivers, even a quarter of it, it would be a big deal to, to the fishing industry. Um, okay, access to upriver spawning habitat remains the major obstacle. And that is where I end and turn it over to Renska, um, who is, uh, again, we're um, focused on the dam at Brunswick Topsum for a part of the study. So, Let's see, I stopped share. And All right, well, let me try to share my screen. And I didn't go over time. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> Can everybody see my screen?
this yeah. way. All right. Let me. Yeah, you need the project button down here. Yeah. Oh. There we go. Okay. So as John set up very beautifully, uh, my project was mainly about the efficacy of the Brunswick Topsom hydroelectric dam in passing American Shad in particular. So first I'll give a quick introduction to American Shad as a species. And so American Shad or Alosa sapidissima, if we're being very fancy, are fish that occur along the eastern coast of North America and they're anadromous fish. What this means is that they live in the ocean, but they come to rivers, so the, to freshwater environments to spawn. And they've been doing this up the Androscoggin for a very long time. Originally, their spawning grounds extended way, way, way far back, but due to the building of dams, some of these spawning grounds are no longer accessible, which is one of the main issues addressed in my research. So John talked very well about the um, environmental importance of each step of the food pyramid, kind of. So I have a quick little illustration to re-emphasize that shad are very important and an integral part of that food web. So even though they do not feed when they are in the river to spawn, they do still provide food for other species. And so as John laid out very nicely, if one of these little elements of a food web disappears, this can have a very great impact on other elements of that food web. Let's talk a little bit about the importance of shad to us as people though. So in his book, The Founding Fish, Chong McPhee described shad just as that, as the founding fish. Now this does not mean that shad were present when the US was founded. However, they played a very important part in a settler's diet and also in the diet of um, the people who lived here before settlers arrived. They were, shad were an incredibly important food source for indigenous peoples and later also for colonists. And shad are therefore often described as the fish that fed the nation's founders. And in this picture, you can see a illustration of what a shad fishery would have looked like, a Native American shad fishery. Lately, however, there have been ongoing concerns of a decline in population of American shad. Um, this is illustrated here with a graph about the declining commercial catch of American shad. Um, as you can see, ever since 1950s, which we know that's when around when the first dam was built, shad have been de declining, or at least the commercial catch of shad has been declining. And knowing that this fish is not only important for the food web, but also for us culturally, and as, of course, an income for certain people, such as uh, fishermen, this is a very concerning uh, trend that we would like to know more about. So Taylor in his 1951 paper described very nicely what was actually causing the disappearance of these shad. And he said that the disappearance of shad from the rivers and streams of Maine was almost entirely a result of their exclusion from spawning areas by dam construction. So what this means is that since shad are not able to access the places that they would usually spawn in, they are instead, because of the building of dams, they are instead spawning in conditions that are less than ideal for them, leading to a lower survival rate of their spawn. As John also already laid out, the Brunswick Topsom hydroelectric dam does have a fish ladder. Uh, there's a picture on the left where in the red little box you can see the actual fish ladder leading up and over the dam. And then I've made a little illustration showing how a fish ladder actually works. And so fish would enter here where it says enter because they are kind of, I don't want to say programmed because that makes them sound like computers, but fish, what fish know is to swim upstream. 
And so they're going to be swimming against the current. And the fish ladder has several levels of this current flowing down. And then the fish also have the opportunity to rest in these little boxes off to the side. And so they could, in theory, swim up a little bit, rest, and then swim up further and then rest. The problem with that is that shad are notoriously not very good swimmers, which is very unfortunate for fish. But <laughs> shad are having a lot of trouble getting up this fish ladder. So then the problem is how do we do something about this? Because this dam has been here for so long and what we have now is just a fish ladder. Well, the dam license is expiring in February of 2029, which means that if we can show that this fish ladder or this dam is negatively impacting shad, and also if we can em emphasize how important shad are as a, uh, an, a part of the food network and also in a cultural and um, personal sense to the people of Brunswick and Topsom, we can then try to show that this dam needs to be adjusted or even removed. So I'm going to get into a little bit of how we are trying to show this to for the relicensing. A good way to show that not a lot of shatter making it up the dam is to use those um, counts that they do have from the dam and compare them to how many fish are actually trying to get up and over the dam. But you might be asking yourself, how do you count fish? Because it's kind of hard to just lay in the water all day and watch fish go by. So what we did this summer and John has done with other students in past summers is we use sonar imaging to visualize um, a part of the Androscoggin. And on the sonar imaging, we could also see the fish swimming by. So we used a very futuristic little machine called the Eris Explorer 3000. And what that does is it sends out sound waves that then when they hit something, produce with what look like, looks like a video, but it's we call it a sonar footprint and that you can see on the right. And I also have plenty of examples so you can kind of visualize it with us a little bit. First though, um, I'm gonna show you the location and the setup of this uh, Explorer 3000. So in the left picture, you can see where we set up the imaging, which was to the right of the bridge. And then to your left, you can see the fish ladder um, and the dam. And so the in yellow, you can see the sonar range. And so this is what we would be able to see on the sonar footprint. And then on the right, you can see a the, the setup of the sonar, which is sticking into the water. So you can't see it, but that's kind of the machinery which goes in. I've then also made a little um, illustration to or orient you to what I looked at for hours this summer to count fish. So the right is kind of a like animated illustration of the left picture of the actual sonar footprint. So the direction of the current is technically going from left to right the way we are looking at it. And then what you're kind of seeing is like a pizza slice of the top of the river. So we are seeing about 20 meters out. And then the prime area for shad would be usually around one to four or five meters from where our instrument was set up. But I did notice that they also were could be seen in any part of the sonar footprint. A few important things to note about this is that one, we cannot see fish outside of this footprint, which means that any fish that kind of elude our technology cannot be seen and therefore cannot be counted. I also counted fish swimming upstream, downstream, and those that were kind of circling within the footprint. I did this because when our fear is that when presenting data to the court, they will say that we have been double counting fish. Um, there's many reasons that this is not true. For one, we, we did actually count those swimming downstream and those circling so that we could subtract those 
from our uh, total count. And also, we only record it on a few days every year for this little slice of the river, which means that what we are counting is most certainly an underestimate of the amount of shad trying to get up the fish ladder and over the dam. Um, the way I identified the fish in uh, the sonar footprint was actually just kind of experience. So all fish kind of have a different shape and behavior and movement. So for example, sturgeon are easy to identify because they're very big and they swim with slower motions than other fish. Alewives are small and they're usually in big groups. And then shad are actually also very fun to identify because they do a little bit of a shimmy because they're not very strong swimmers. So every fish that was a little bit like shimmying of the current, I could be pretty certain that it was a shad, especially if I was able to compare it in size to other fish within the sonar footprint. I now have a couple of examples of what you could, for example, see on the sonar footprint. So this is a video of a bass following alewives. And so this big group of fish, those are alewives, and then you're gonna see the bass come in pretty soon. Renska, those are juvenile alewives. Oh. So they're like, you know, four centimeters long. Yeah. And here, here come the bass. <laughs> those are I suppose smallmouth bass. That that's just a classic predator prey right there. That could have been on the Serengeti and been lions after <laughs> gazelles or something. <laughs> Next, I have a quick clip of some juvenile sturgeon, which are also very cool to see, and that also shows um, the kind of the sonar shadow that you can see projected onto the rocks in the back. And on these, we thought they were short-nosed sturgeon. They're a little over a meter long usually. So the numbers are meters on the side. Um, but Tom Squires, the a fisheries biologist at DMR said those are juvenile Atlantic sturgeon. Yeah. And then here, my personal favorite is um, kind of the underwater view of a sturgeon jumping out and landing back into the river. Also, all of these are sped up um, because usually it goes pretty slowly, but luckily the technology allows us to speed up these images. So you're gonna see it entered the water right there. So I thought it'd be a fun um, little aside to talk about these jumping surgeon because I think it's something we've all seen and that we're all very fascinated by. So I also have a video that John took of a sturgeon jumping um, down by the dam. And so they go quite quick and they're quite big. So it's a bit jarring the first time you see it. Um, but you might be asking yourself, and I was asking myself this this summer, was why do sturgeon jump? And there's not a lot known about why they actually jump. But in, in doing a little bit of research, I found that the main key hypothesis is that sturgeon jump to communicate with others within their group. Um, they did find that sturgeon jump more during the morning and during the evening and not as much when they weren't in a group, but this is just a hypothesis. And so there's still a lot to be discovered about uh, our river systems and the organisms that live in them. So let's get to the results of my summer research. Um, first, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about results from 2017 when one of John's other students, Mira Prashad, did um, this same research that I was doing this summer. Uh, and on five days in 2017, Mira counted 14,218 shad, of which one made it across the fish ladder. So this is a very, very jarring image. Um, in 2022, so my year, it looked a little bit better, dare I say. 
Um, so this this is a dated slide. So Chad passed out as of um, I want to say late July was two hundred and twenty four. But at that point, I had counted seven thousand six hundred and thirty three Chad trying to come up the fish ladder. So this is an incredibly small amount that actually made it. Also considering that what we are counting is an underestimate since we're only seeing a part of the river on a few days. I put all of these data together because John has been um, collecting data also in the years that he didn't have students. So between 2017 and 2022 and putting all that data together, there were in total 20,616 shad swimming upstream. And of those shad, 897 made it up the dam. Again, what we counted was an underestimate. And so this is really showing that the dam is not, or the fish ladder rather, is not doing enough for shad. And I think it's important to note that right now is a good time to start getting people to, to start making people aware of this issue as there there's two uh, news articles that I put to the side of people actually gaining interest in this dam and getting kind of curious about what is causing fish die off. And so with this momentum, we can kind of start collecting data for the 2029 uh, relicensing. So that means counting shad that are trying to get up the dam and showing that there's so many more trying to get up than the ones that actually pass the dam. So you might be asking, well, what's wrong with the fish ladder? And so both salmon and shad are getting kind of beat up when they're trying to pass this fish ladder. And as I said before, shad are not strong enough swimmers to swim against the flow of the fish ladder. Now, when I was looking at data of shad passing the dam of the past years, there is kind of a discrepancy in some of the years where suddenly a lot of shad will make it. And then in 2017, there was one, but then in 2021, uh, I think over 200 shad did make it across the dam. And it would be interesting to figure out whether that is kind of an issue with flow rate, whether they would be more able to swim up the fish ladder if it had a less strong flow or if it was less steep. Um, in 2017, Mira did talk to local engineers and these conversations have implied that improvements to the dam can be made. And so that improvements to this fish ladder could ensure that shad would be able to make it up better and that they would be able to make it to their spawning grounds where they can spawn under conditions that are more ideal to them than panickedly at the bottom of the dam. So some alternatives, if improvements can be made, some alternatives to the fish ladder we have right now could be a fish lift, like uh, John was describing at Benton Falls. However, we are not very certain of how successful that would be in regards to shad. Uh, since shad are also notoriously nervous and they, as Nate Gray said it once, die if you look at them wrong. So maybe that is not the best option for shad, but maybe still better than a fish ladder. Of course, total removal of the dam would be preferred, but that might be a very hard case to fight. And then again, changes to the current fish ladder um, that would possibly decrease flow or steepness to limit the negative impact on shad and also other fish such as salmon that are passing or trying to pass the dam. And again, to reemphasize, this all depends on the 2029 relicensing of the dam. And so the collection of these data is very important in order to show that consistently the dam or the fish ladder is failing in what it is trying to do. So thank you for listening. And I think we can open it up for questions unless John has something to do. Red Scott, I'd like to just qualify a bit with the meeting with the engineers. Um, what they, they were actually pretty reluctant to say much, given that Brookfield could be, you know, a, um, a client of theirs. 
Um, but what they did say is it could be improved. And I really think they were talking about the fact that salmon get scraped up so much. And probably they didn't, weren't probably worried too much about shad either. <laughs> and they did say the design could be more, um, less turbulent within the each chamber so that there'd be, you know, be less likely that salmon would get scraped up. I suppose shad would too. So in other words, it really, nothing they suggested would help the problem that shad are just reluctant to go up the ladder. They don't find it or they don't, you know, they just don't want to go up that ladder. Okay. So now we can take questions. I don't know if you can, um, unshare so we can see people better yeah did that work all right yeah folks you can unmute and ask your questions or if you put your hand up um we can call on you or you can put your questions in the chat Right, Charlie. Yeah, I just had a, a question. Um, understanding some of the challenges around the fishway, uh, are there examples or known examples of the fish lifts being efficacious for shad? Um, where they they may are there examples where those have worked, either in Maine or elsewhere, or does anybody know? Um, I don't know if there are good examples where they work for shad. Nate, so at Benton Falls, they get shad that do go into the bucket and head up the, you know, head up to the lift. Um, Nate has to fish, like I, I mentioned, he has to fish them out because they won't pass through the counters. They're too big. Um, the counters are just basically PVC tubes that have an electric current going through there so that each time a, a alewife or blueback herring goes through, they count them. Um, they do, so they, at least some make it up there, but we don't know how many are below, really. You know, if it's just, a, a, if there's lots of them down there, just a few. Um, they are, um, I mean, I spoke with a, I was at a meeting with a Brookfield um, guy, and he afterwards he asked me, can you guarantee that shad will go into the bucket? And I had to say no. I can't guarantee that. Alicia or Alicia, if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. Mm, thanks. Um, is it a, a foregone conclusion that the dam is going to stay and we're just looking for a fish passage option? Uh, not to my knowledge. And so how can we get involved in advocating for better passage, which might invoke it. Well, removing the dam right down in Brunswick only gets the fish a little bit farther run, right? Because we have- There's more dams. Dam with no passage at all. So I have to keep that in mind. Um, but how, how would you recommend citizens get involved in advocating for improved passage here? Um, actually, Charlie, I noticed Charlie's in the audience here. He, he might be able to answer that better than I. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I thanks for that question, and I'm I'm just really in the last year started to learn about this, and, and uh, you may have noticed in the announcement for this that in May I think I'm supposed to give some um, information around the the relicensing process, and that's really where, as indicated in some of the slides, these things happen every forty to fifty years. It's a once in a generation or once in a lifetime opportunity to make changes. And that's an artifact of things that happened, uh, you know, 100 years ago. Um, and so the the real time to have input on the licensing process with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which is the entity that determines the licensing and works with state and local uh, and federal agencies, is during that relicensing process. And 2029 for this dam, um, the the process actually starts five years before. So it will begin in 2024 and whatever we can do to formulate a, a strategy around thinking about what would be optimal there. Although you can see that technically it's hard to answer that question. And uh, then um, 
gathering, you know, or creating awareness around the issue and then um, forming a, a coalition and, and some uh, voice as part of the um, relicensing processes is what I know to do at this point. None of that has happened yet, but that's the beginning of kind of the map around that. Okay, thank you. I mean, it's, uh, there's a great article in the Friends of Mary Meeting Bay newsletter about water quality and this issue, and it's great to see your program. And of course, the Nature Conservancy offices look right down over the, the dam. So it feels like there's some really strong players paying attention. And, and if you need some, some lay people, we're out here too. Steve? Yeah, just to note, I, I'm a lay person. Yeah. I, I just have a, a very strong interest in, in this and um, in trying to figure this out. And, and you're, you make a good point. TNC looks at this dam all day long. So, do, uh, so does the uh, uh, Maine Coast Heritage Trust. So uh, there are some people that are proximal to the, to the issue, at least in the case of this dam. Steve Hines and then Nancy. Oops, how? Yeah, hi, uh, Steve Hines with Chad Unlimited. Uh, you know, as I understand it, uh, you know, this dam, we shouldn't expect it to be passing shad or really anything all that well. It's just a scaled down version of a Alaskan design, as I understand it, that really doesn't meet modern design standards, you know, to any great extent. Uh, one of the things that uh, I guess the study didn't talk about was attractant flow, which is very important. Uh, you know, to get fish to pass a fish ladder, you got to get them uh, into it to start with. Uh, any comments on that? Yeah, I um, prior to um, acquiring the sonar, we had uh, we used um, uh, video cameras along the side of the ladder. One was one was at the mount, the opening of the ladder where the fish would go in, and one was upstream, about one hundred and twenty-five feet, I think. And so it just caught fish about three or four feet out because that's as far as you could see in the water. And so even there, there were thousands of fish that would make it up to that point, maybe, and maybe a hundred, you know, hundred or 200 that actually go into the ladder. And so if you look at what's happening there is the um, the water is basically like a wall of bubbles coming out of the turbines. Um, my understanding is the water flows down through the turbines and, and back up like this, and it's all aerated. And it's just, I mean, you can see it on the, in the video cameras. It's like a wall of bubbles. So it could be also just simply that the fish just are confused by the, with this wall of bubbles. And uh, I mean, a lot of alewives make it through, but who knows how many alewives are down below there? Um, you know, there's hundreds of thousands that make it up, but we're talking about the third largest river in Maine, right? So hundreds of thousands isn't a lot for the third largest river in Maine. And, you know, everybody, you know, alewife, who knows how many alewives are down below there? It could, it could be there's a million, you know, a couple million of alewives down below. Yeah, so so it sounds like that that's part of the re, part part of what's wrong is you don't have the I, attracted flows or the the uh, the uh, operations of the dam themselves are are keeping the fish from from reaching the fish ladder. I I think we could and we could probably check on this. They had um, I think it might have been so we've uh, as Renska said I have been doing this uh, less well um, personed just by myself with uh, help from someone from the Friends of Mary Meaning Bay, either Ed or somebody else, a little bit here and there over the last few years. And I think it might have been 2021 or 2020 when there was like three or three or 400 made it up. And it was pretty quick that a lot of them made it up. And I would I think the reason was is that the turbines were shut down for some reason. So in other words, it's suggesting that this hypothesis is valid, you know, or at least worth looking into, you know, that yeah. they, they're just not finding the opening. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, do I, as I understand it, there's there's two other studies going on besides yours there of uh, fish passage this summer. I, I think Brookfield's doing one and maybe DMR. You Can you comment on that? Um, 
You know, uh, I did not check in with the DMR people at the end of this season. I know Ed Friedman did, um, but I, di I didn't really check in with them. I, I don't know if Renska, do you, um, I, don't, I can't remember if we t walked up and talked to the guy up there at the dam. I know that Ed did, but. Yeah, I think okay. Ed did. Um, yeah, and he, he mentioned that as well. So yeah, we're not, you know, we're, we're just counting the fish down there and um, and not interfering with anybody else. And it's just, you know, we're, we're ho hopefully this will, what we do will contribute to the discussion that's coming. Well, I you know, it's just great to have someone who you can trust doing the studies. I mean, yeah. uh, Brooke Brookfield's been called out for not uh, dealing in, in good faith uh, with, with, with a lot of the people, the agencies that, uh, and I, uh, people that, that have tried to negotiate and do business with them. So I uh, just uh, really salute you guys for uh, for for giving for uh, giving this a uh, an honest look. And I'm sure that this is going to be very important going forward. So thanks for doing I, that. I would I would say that the previous owner of Florida Power and Light was much more cooperative. You know, we we had access to the ladder and so on, and a lot of the dam infrastructure, you know, with their, we, we had computers set up and stuff like that, which Brookfield is all off limits. Yeah, well, they're, 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 they're 60, at least, you know, somewhere between a 12 and $60 billion uh, international company. I think they do business in five, five different companies. Uh, I think they're, they're now the largest dam owner in the United States. And, uh, I'll tell you, it's, uh, you know, the, in my experience, they don't negotiate. And what they're trying to do here is just, if if you want something from, from them, you're going to have to force them. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's only with research like what, like this, that you're going to have the ammunition it's going to take to affect change. So once again, thanks. Right. Nancy, do you want to ask your question? Um, I have a totally unscientific observation. Um, I kayak in the Andrews, in the Mary Meeting Bay quite a bit, and um, usually sort of slack tide between low and high. Um, but a couple of weeks ago, I was in there at dead low tide, and you know it's pretty shallow anyway, but I was in Butler Cove, um, which is off Sturgeon Island, and I was amazed at the amount of vegetation I saw on the on the um, bay bed. If that's the right term. The last time I was in dead low tide, there was no, nothing quite like that, and I, I was just struck by. I maybe it was the drought, and I saw more of it, or the circumstance, whatever. But I I don't know if that's for you all a sign that the vegetation is recovering more rapidly in that particular area. It, yeah, exactly. That um, actually Butler Cove was one of our um, sites where we set up plots and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, this is way back. In, um, and actually, I think one of the pictures I showed with students um, had me there with um, three or four students. And we what we were in the, you know, we were in Butler Cove and we were basically setting up a transplant experiment with um, with tape grass to see if we could get it, you know, if it'd still be there the next year, if maybe we could begin transplanting the plants back in. And the next year, when we went back out there, we couldn't even find our plots because there had been so much natural recruitment uh -huh. that you know we couldn't tell what was what. And it's hard to it's hard to make permanent boundaries out there anyway because of all the ice movement up and down and sideways and everything. Um, you know, so we did put some rebar posts in and we found, you know, so we were able to do it, but it was sort of like, well, we don't need to worry about revegetating this. It's happening by itself. And that, and the difference in time where there wasn't much there that could, it's, it's senescent. The plants are senescent. So they'll all die back in the fall. And then in the, it takes them quite a while in the spring before you really begin to see them uh, sprouting out again. And usually they're maxed by August. Mm -hmm. So you may have been, you know, in May, early in the year or late in the year and not seen them. That was, it was um, in July, I think. Yeah, it's, uh, 
that vegetation is the whole ball game in terms of aquatic food web. There's not a lot of uh, work in estuaries like Miramini Bay, although there's uh, more and more from the Chesapeake region, but there's thousands of papers about aqu aquatic vegetation in lakes and the pivotal role. It's basically found, it's, it's foundational for the habitat in lakes. And there's no reason to think it wouldn't be in rivers too. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Oh, I saw a hand. Steve hands back up. Yeah, um, just something that occurred to me that really I hadn't thought about. I've, I've, I've got a little boat and from time to time I uh, do a little fishing from uh, in, in the uh, lower um, Kennebec. And, you know, one thing that struck me is when you go, you know, it seems like there's plenty of vegetation in Merry Meeting Bay. I mean, you know, it, it, it's everything from wild rice to, I, I don't know, things I, I can't identify, pickle weed and a, a, just a whole number of things. You know, it seems like you see a lot of carp yeah. in, um, you know, in Merry Meeting Bay, but then it's like, you know, when you go upstream and you get around Swan Island and up to to uh, Augusta and around there, there's some places where there's rocks and old cribs and those kinds of things. You see smallmouth bass, there's sturgeon everywhere. Um, but I just wonder, is, do you, do, does any, I mean, there's so many introduced species there too. You've got, uh, was it white catfish, you know, are, are in there and, in, in, you know, in some abundance, the, you know, the carp or, you know, obviously the worst, the worst of, of, of that is, is there any, do you have any kind of a vision of what, you know, some kind of a steady state recovery, uh, you know, uh, you know, fish assemblage might look like uh, in, you know, 20, 30 years? Or is, is that what you're looking at to, for this thing to norm out at, at some, some, uh, some point? That's a tough question. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I mean, um, people have gone to extreme levels to get rid of carp. This is a common carp. It was introduced in the 1880s, 1890s. Um, and, you know, 50 years later, it's beginning to be a problem. So there was a paper, there was an engineering report, I think it was in the early 80s, talking about the turbidity problem in the Eastern River, and they basically blamed it on carp, um, which I, I totally believe and understand that because they root in the silt and they stir everything up. That's what they do in lakes everywhere. That's how they forage. They're, they're foraging in that silt. Um, I, had, uh, I, I haven't been as oft, out as often in the last, let's say five years or so, seven years. And I was sort of thinking the carp were maybe backing off a bit um, and wondering if the white catfish were the reason for that. Um, but it's, you know, it's just um, as a, as an ecologist, it's sort of like this, I don't really, I don't really predict <laughs> showing that marine food web. That was a point I was trying to make is like, you, we really can't predict what's going to happen to this thing at all. There's too many, there's too many components and they're all, they're not all linked, but there are a lot of links in between them all. And as soon as you get a couple of links, there's all kinds of dynamics that can happen in a, in a system, you know, in any system. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of interesting because I, I, I got to go on one of the uh, uh, fish assemblage uh, 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 sessions with the uh, Midwest Biodiversity Institute there uh, at Waterville and you know, there's, there's still a, you know, like so many main rivers, there's a bunch of white suckers in there. And it seems like if something were going to get hit, uh, you know, it, it, what, what, what are, what, what would compete with them? You'd think it'd be the carp and you'd think it'd be the yeah. catfish, but yeah. you know, they're still, still, you know, like so many places in Maine, they're, they're still a big part of the biomass, but no, it just, it just kind of gets me. You get, it's like around Swan Island, there's, it doesn't seem like, it seems like there should, you see, should see more fish. It seems like there should be more abundance, but it does, it doesn't seem to be there. And it just, it's one of those things that just kind of baffles me. And, you know, yeah. I, 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 I just don't, you know, I just, I, just I, it, really. I am quite sure the sturgeon are coming back strong just from, just from being out there in places. Oh, yeah. Like the first day that Ed Friedman and I set up, 
um, I, this might have been last year, um, the sonar at Brunswick Topsom. We're sitting there, you know, just turn the thing on and you just kind of sit there for several, you know, check it once in a while and you're just kind of reading a book or whatever. And there, I'm telling you, there must have been 80 jumps, sturgeon jumps in an hour there in that, or in that time we were waiting. It was getting to the point where you wouldn't even look anymore. They were so common. And they're, you know, they're Atlantic sturgeon, the big, the big guys. So um, that wasn't true in the past. Yeah. I guess we'll see. We'll see. Does anybody else have any questions? No, not seeing hands. No one's unmuting themselves. All right. Um, everyone, thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, and Renska and John, thank you for lending your time, your knowledge, your research, your experience to everyone here this evening. We really appreciate it. Um, hopefully you'll join us again sometime. Um, before everyone trots off, I just want to let the folks here know that this spring, CREA and BTLT are partnering, as, uh, as John mentioned I, earlier with Charlie, to do a more in-depth presentation on the dam relicensing process. For those of you who are interested in taking part, now that you've learned all this fascinating information, check back in come spring. All right. Have okay. a lovely evening, everyone. Thank you. Um, Goodbye, everybody. Thanks for uh, coming. Thank you for coming. Bye. Thank I'll you. See you later, Renska. Excellent. Good Thank you.